To kick off today, we're thrilled to open with our keynote panel moderated by Don Novo, Principal at Health Management Associates. Please put your hands together for Don, who will welcome the remainder of this morning's panelists. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for rising early and enjoying your breakfast and uh, participating in our breakfast keynote discussion this morning. My name is Don Novo. I'm a principal with the firm Health Management Associates, and I'm going to be uh, working with my esteemed panel here to help moderate this session. Um, I would ask for them to uh, provide an introduction. We'll start with Mary Jo, who's sitting over to my right. Good morning. I'm Mary Jo Cagle. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at Cone Health. We're located in Central North Carolina, headquartered in Greensboro, where our work in population health is centered around our ACO, our next-gen ACO, and our own Medicare MA product that we have. Great. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thank Joe. you. And Wayne, good morning. Uh, good morning, Wayne Jenkins. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at Vanderbilt University Medical Center for Population Health, and that involves oversight of population health within uh, the Vanderbilt program. And then also we have the Vanderbilt Affiliated Health Network, and that is health systems, physicians that are affiliated with us, and particularly around value-based care population health measures. Uh, that's about 60 hospitals, 5,000 clinicians through the state, now going down into Mississippi, up into Kentucky. Johnny Piedmont, I'm the Global uh, Chief for uh, Pediatric Research across the enterprise of the Cleveland Clinic. I also am uh, the Founding Director of a new Center for Pediatric Research, and I am the Academic Chair for the Department of Pediatrics of our medical school, that is the Lerner College of Medicine, which is part of Case Western Research, uh, Reserve University. Great. Well, thank you, uh, everyone. We're happy to have you here this morning. Definitely. Uh, Happy to have such an esteemed group of uh, colleagues here. Um, I think what we'd like to do this morning really is to kind of kick off the discussion and begin to uh, talk about population health. Um, I know we're gonna, <clears throat> we're gonna touch base on um, the aspects of personalized medicine and how your organizations have really geared up um, with your abilities to utilize big data and um, talk a little bit about some of the approaches and strategies that you've built and um, I think also we you know, talk a little bit about the databases, the use of genomics, and how you really are able to tie that data um, together, both um, at a population level and being able to drill down a little more to an uh, uh, individual level. It would be great. So um, with that, why don't we start off with Giovanni, if you can talk to us just a little bit kind of about the principles of precision medicine and um, the use of some big data in, in, those, in those approaches? Well, I think in precision medicine, there are two uh, fundamental components that are being developed uh, pretty much at the same time. One uh, has to do with, uh, with the, the collection of data <coughs> from patients. And I, personally, I, I am a little bit biased. I think that that is the area that is gonna create more disruption than any other. Because <clears throat> the general idea is to have individualized information on individual patients, which is a, a Copernican revolution in medicine because we have always looked at it in, in a, from the standpoint of the physician. And also, currently, and I see continuing to see patients, the only way that we have to collect information from patients is to ask for their history which is extremely inefficient and wildly inaccurate in many cases. So one of the areas of precision medicine uh, is trying to take a lot of advantage from what has been done in uh, um, airplane engineering. Um, many people don't know this, but if you buy <coughs> an airplane, they're gonna give you, um, as uh, on, on the side, um, a digital, um, high resolution image um, that is called um, digital twin. And that basically is a 1,000 billion uh, degrees of freedom, ac super accurate high fidelity reproduction of the engine of that airplane. And that allows basically, and not only basically gives you the 
idea of all the materials and the structure of the engine, but also allows you to in interpolate uh, all the data coming from the hundreds of sensors that are built into each engine to give you in real time um, exactly what's going on in that, and, and make sure, of course, that you don't crash. Um, so what we do in medicine currently is to take a snapshot at a specific time of the patient. What we are going to do in the future is to have real-time film of the health state of that patient, which not only is going to include the genetic component of that, but is going to include something that, in my personal opinion, is even more important, which is the exposome, which is the collection of all the influences that are uh, in the environment of that individual. The second part is the more classical, is uh, the genomic part, the pharmacogenomic parts, uh, that has been around for quite some time, but only now we have the tools of uh, understanding uh, uh, on the basis of genomic and epigenomic analysis, um, start understanding why certain individuals respond to certain drugs in specific ways. That is, again, a Copernican. Why? Because our medicine for centuries has been built on trials, in particular double-blind placebo control trial. That gives you the answer for an average, but nobody's average. <laughs> so uh, there are people who are going to respond better, who are going to respond less. People are going to die of that medicine. So this is inverting our point of view and look at what is the right medicine for that particular individual. So those, in my opinion, are the two components that are going to really revolutionize uh, medicine into being more precise in the future. Great, thank you, uh, Giovanni. And you, you kind of, you touched on the fact that we'd be col collecting more information. So medicine historically has been, as you stated, a snapshot in time. And I think one of the, one of the big challenges is <clears throat> being able to collect that information and for physicians really to be able to have the ability when they're in front of a patient to know more about the patient than what the patient is able to present to the physician. And I, I think, you know, in that instance, uh, Vanderbilt's doing some really interesting things in that way of being able to really kind of collect a lot of, um, a lot of data to help kind of move in that direction of um, looking at genomic profiles and um, being, able to co being able to connect that information and make it readily available for, uh, for clinicians. So um, maybe, Wayne, you could talk a little bit about some of the things that you're doing at Vanderbilt in that area. So, as Giovanni was, was speaking, it, that's a good question because that was what I was thinking about in terms of some of the work we're doing. So just as, as some background, at, at Vanderbilt, it's probably at least about 10 years ago, and some of the prescient people set up the, you know, sort of really had the idea that, you know, the genomic sciences, information sciences really are one. Um, how do you pull those together? And and how would they get at the forefront of that? So uh, we were just awarded a $70 million grant to be the coordinating center for this million person, all of us, geno nationwide genomic study. And the, so the individuals who had organized that, you know, take the, you know, this medical record, de-identify it, and everybody who comes into Vanderbilt uh, for years uh, you probably don't realize, you know, that you're signing this, but, you know, they can take any excess blood and they can sequence it, and we're now up to almost a quarter of a million uh, samples in our database to match the medical record. And that's really what has given that expertise, you know, to start looking at, you know, what's the phenome studies to link to the genome, what's the genome to link back to the phenome. So, you know, that marrying of the genomic studies to the information is critical, but now going to your question, what I, what I think is, was interesting is they were, the university was the first place to take a genomic study around metabolism of Plavix and connect it into decision support in the, <coughs> at, the, at the point of care. So being on the delivery side, you know, we start thinking a lot about, you know, this information explosion and everybody's bombarded with more information, but how do we execute and deliver in a reliable way on that information? So I would say when we think about precision, personalized medicine, 
a lot of my thoughts go to, is it delivered? Because if you just think about all of the things that we know that we should be doing now that we're not doing, to me, this is going to add to the list. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's interesting because um, I think, you know, Mary Jo can really kind of represent the other side of the equation, looking at the ACO model and the ACO world and how you, you know, ACO is really focused on um, providing excellent care, but also controlling the cost and how you utilize that information and, and the population health strategies really to um, provide the, the care within your, your organization. Can you talk a little bit about that for sure. us? Sure. So I'm thankful that we have folks doing the work that these gentlemen are doing because they will inform how we deliver the best quality cost at the best price as we move forward. And there is more to individualized medicine than, than what the genome tells us. It's also about the capability of individual patients um, to access care and to uh, be compliant with what we as the caregivers uh, discuss with them and ask them to do. So as we have looked at our data, we have begun to really look at um, our utilization data, the payer, all payer data, and crosswalk it with um, our zip code data and look at our region and understand what zip codes are our high utilizers. We've developed heat maps. We've shared that with our providers and with our health system and with our community partners and understood that we have certain regions in our um, community that are at greater risk for utilizing our health system repeatedly. And we've even broken that down by certain disease states so that we understand that. And so um, I'll share a, a particular case with you that we understand even though asthma in our uh, pediatric population is fairly evenly distributed across the geographic area that we serve, that we have a specific geographic locale that are high utilizers of our ED services in our highest um, area, that one zip code of being readmitted and having bad outcomes. So why is it that that specific area, the children in that specific area have different outcomes and are higher utilizers? We went to work on that to understand the difference even though asthma is evenly distributed across our geographic area. So there were some interesting things we found out about access to regular care for those children. We found out about the living conditions of those children. They lived in public housing. And so we began to partner with our city partners. So to us, that's a part of individualized medicine too, is truly understanding the needs of the individuals that you serve. Understanding your data to the point that you can make a difference. We partnered actually with the city of Greensboro uh, to go into the housing there, and they were willing to take out carpet to change the cooling systems and heating systems and change the filters. We actually lowered the utilization, the readmission rates, uh, and got better outcomes for those children. And to me, that's a part of individualized medicine. But, but to do that, we really had to slice and dice our data and understand the data that we had, and certainly the city didn't have access to. So as we've uh, begun to work in our ACO and, and have greater access to our data and been able to look at it in different ways, we can begin to affect outcomes in ways that we've not been able to affect them before. Wonderful, thank you, Mary Jo. So let me ask you a question in looking at that because in the, in the advent of personalizing medicine, it sounds like you've built an approach where you can almost build a profile of patients knowing where they live, so looking at their zip code, um, providing the, <clears throat> the clinicians with kind of information to um, lead them to look at certain trigger effects. Mm -hmm. 
that may affect an individual. So you, you brought up the issues of asthma, probably obesity, yes. COPD, some of those other issues. Can you talk a little bit about strategies in which you um, use to kind of um, use that, that population health information as um, preventative approaches? Well, certainly. Care? Yeah, it's the, the data has become part of our strategic planning so that we can look and say for, um, do we need to have certain um, geographic plans to address access? So access is part of our strategic plan, so that absolutely has become part of it. With our physicians, we actually have a specific strategy around diabetes, which I suspect that's on everybody's list to look at. And we actually are developing an, an app that our uh, clinicians use to activate our patients and to um, reach a certain group, and especially our employees. That's probably on most people's lists. So yes, so we've been able to segment and look at certain groups of patients. So, and we have done it, not surprisingly, at the ones who um, we know that are high utilizers, um, whose cost is disproportionate to what we think it should be when we compare it to benchmarks. So when we look at the per member per month cost, because that's our lens now that we look in this ACO world. And where we believe there is a way that we can begin to get down and understand subgroups. So again, we break it across not only the uh, zip codes, but we break it into uh, age group distribution, gender distribution, uh, ethnicity. Are we doing well with um, our uh, Caucasian folks, but missing our African American or Latino or Arabic folks? You know, we're trying to look and say, where do we need to offer better care and access? And maybe we're missing it. So we're able to slice and dice our data in different ways to determine where do we need to do a better job in our community that we're missing it. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, do, do you have something more to add in that area? As far as I know, Giovanni, you really speaking about being able to kind of have almost real time um, information you, you were you know kind of speaking to the approach of the historical way but kind of moving towards yeah, more I, I think that Mary Jo has been touching on some critical points of population health and I've been spending a, a few months writing my new book uh, on it and in looking uh, at how to properly explain and define I found out that the concepts have been around for a long time and actually, um, when, I, when I tried to explain this uh, recently to a, to a group of students, um, this really started in an orchard in Switzerland in 1906. There was this gentleman who liked to grow peas, but was also an incredible mathematician. His name was uh, Pareto. And he noticed something. He noticed that 80% of the peas were being produced by only 20% of the pea pods. That became, became the Pareto Principle, and he used it actually to explain how 80% of the land in Italy was actually owned by only 20% of the people. Now, move forward to 1943, a very smart mathematician and, and economist in, uh, in the United States, <clears throat> his name was Juras, uh, Joseph Juras, basically liked the idea, and he used it to actually uh, explain how 80% of the defects in a production chain come from only 20% of the causes. And he called it uh, the Pareto Principle, but also the rule of the uh, precious or critical few mm -hmm. and the trivial many. So the general, and then basically after the war, he started going uh, to give lectures in Japan. And uh, one of these lectures, actually, there was a guy called Toyoda and that's where the Toyota lean process comes from. The general idea is that this is a general biological and economical law that applies incredibly well to uh, healthcare. 80% of the cost come from 20% of the patient, and 80% of the income for our companies come from 20% of the patients too. Uh, now, once you understand that, it's clear that to follow the 
outcomes of a single patient is pretty useless. You have to understand what the whole population is doing. And particularly, go and understand where are the 20% precious critical few that are driving 80% of your cost. And that's where what she just described became essential because those are the 20% that are less likely to come to your hospital. You need to go and get them because you don't want that 20% to grow to a 30 or 40%, right? So what we did, what I did uh, a few years ago, in a similar way, I remember something that my grandmother used to tell me that if Mohammed doesn't go to the mountain, the mountain has to go to Mohammed. And so I retrofitted a, a, a van, um, converted it into a pediatric clinic, and uh, basically sent my physicians to the schools. In one year, we gave 9,000 shots, flu shots, because those families did not uh, refuse to take the shots. They just didn't have the car to come to the to, to, to main <coughs> campus and get the shots. Um, it, it has been so successful that many of those schools have now decided to create micro clinics inside the school. The same thing is happening at, at, app, at Apple, at uh, many other companies, and so forth. So it's a different way of looking at medicine, understanding that you need to follow the outcomes of a general population in order to identify those individuals that actually are really driving the cost. It's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that with us. So um, let me ask then what, the, what your organizations have been doing in that instance to kind of um, drive the populations that are harder to reach. So you have, um, you know, you, you have an active population that comes to you, but you have kind of, as you had talked about, the 80-20 principle where you have a, a number of uh, individuals that won't seek care. What are some of the um, innovative strategies that you've used in um, population health outreach? You spoke of the, the, the van approach, and I know Mary Jo spoke about some of the um, technology approaches. Can you guys talk a little bit about those for us? So um, one of the issues that we've tried uh, and that has been successful is we're partnering with emergency medicine. We identified a group of patients who won't respond to our case managers. <laughs> they have a distrust of the health system at large, but when they're in trouble, they call 911. And so, we, so they are high utilizers of the ED when they get in trouble. And so what we've done is uh, we pay for two EMS trucks and their crew, and they make visits to our high-risk CHF and COPD patients and they visit them at their home. And, um, and that, those crews, we do the training for them to recognize and, and we've developed the protocols on how to intervene and prevent visits to the ED. And interestingly enough, they trust the EMS workers because that's who they call when they're in trouble. And so we have reduced uh, ED utilization and admissions in those cr groups and they'll let them come to their home. So uh, that's been an interesting intervention that we've done with that group of folks who don't want to see the doctor, won't, won't let our case manager see them, but, and it has, has, has a very high ROI. That's an easy thing for us to pay for. So that's been a really interesting thing to when we pinpointed and recognized that group that we couldn't get to the doctor and wouldn't let our case manager see them. So l let me answer the question like in, in, one, in one way, but then go back to sort of some of my thoughts around personalized medicine, as we were discussing before, tied to population health. So at Vanderbilt, there will be some similar programs of, you know, say, a high ED utilizers. How do you get care managers? There's an interesting program it's called street psychiatry that goes, I mean, that's set up on um, homeless psychiatric clinics where they go out to homeless shelters, some of our psychiatrists, you know, for the same type of thing. So I think if you look at different healthcare systems, I think we're all sort of doing different variations of those things. The thing that becomes uh, having oversight of population health 
is, is cost effectiveness. And I, I go back to your comments about the kids with asthma and, and you go in and you change the carpet. So in, in that sense, like, okay, you may decrease that, but like, where do we just draw the line in carpet changing, you know? Which, you know, which subset of patients? Um, where do we put resources on psychiatric utilization of the ED? So I'm always bumping up against, you know, resource allocation for these different subsets of patients. So one of the things that I think that the personalized medicine, sort of back to your 80-20 rule or 99-1, whatever we break it out is, you know, anyone who does care coordination for population health, you're always thinking, what's my subset of patients that this becomes cost effective for? So the more we can do this, I mean, if it's collecting data around zip codes of asthma use or, you know, uh, genomic abnormality that predicts high utilization, I think it allows us to stratify our patients in a way that we may have more cost-effective population health delivery because, to me, that's, it, it strains the resources uh, the way it's done now. And I completely agree. Actually, this is where, in my opinion, population health and precision medicine join. Because the only solution to what we are discussing, in my opinion, is precision medicine, particularly in the data acquisition component. So in other terms, we can do all these things. It costs money. It costs personnel. Uh, and still, it's almost impossible to reach really the population that we need to reach. Uh, on top of that, <clears throat> I was talking about the sensors in the engine. There is a big difference between a human being and an engine. The human being can refuse to actually give you information or come to the clinic. So what is the solution? The solution, I think, is uh, to eliminate that division between the patient and the person who has to take care of the patient. And that can be achieved by collecting data with new technologies. And the technologies are available. Um, they are just not as diffuse. For example, what is the solution of uh, making sure that you have all the women at risk come at the right time to get their mammogram, particularly if they have uh, socioeconomic issues that prevent that? Well, there is a company that is developing a bra that has uh, sensors that are able to sense the uh, photo uh, acoustic motion of the blood, because the first thing that happens when you start having a nodule is it becomes hypervascularized. So these bros are going to be able to perceive way before um, when something is going on in the breast and hopefully eliminate that divide by directly transmitting information to a data collection center. There is a, a, another project I saw the other day. It's called TOTO which is not the rock band, is actually a toilet. But this is an actual smart toilet that is able to sample uh, uh, feces and urine to basically detect uh, biomarkers of, of uh, several diseases. Personally, the most exciting thing I, I have seen and was actually published in Science Translational Medicine a few weeks ago, uh, a group has developed a, a, a bioactive tattoo. I think it's going to be the future in which basically they can install sensors that are able to sense the concentration of calcium in the blood, which is one of the first things that happens when you start developing a neoplasia. Um, and they call it actually a, a bio, biomedical mole. Looks like a mole. It, other people prefer tattoo. You can shape it the way you want. But basically, these are the new ways that we are going to be able to collect real-time, continuous, prospective information and allow us to intervene early. Because the connection, the, the element that is particularly in common between population health and precision medicines are the prevention versus the um, therapy and uh, the ability to obtain information at the time that when you can still affect uh, the disease, and in particular, to bring the power in the hands of the patient. So in both cases, population health and precision medicine, the ultimate goal 
is to pretty much, like uh, my friend Bartolini of Aetna says, eliminate hospitals, allow people to have actually direct feedback from the devices that we are currently using, and take care of most of the care outside of the areas where we provide care today um, in, a, in a much cheaper mm -hmm. way, and in a way that identifies and treats particularly the population at risk. Thank you, Giovanni. So it's interesting because you, you speak about a lot of the wearable devices, and we're beginning to kind of see them more kind of um, you know, be, become more mainstream, people wearing Fitbits and their iPhones, collecting information, Apple Watches and things of that nature. How do we, how do we pull all of that information? Because there's, there's information, really almost information overload. There's information, we're collecting information everywhere. How do we, you know, how do we get all of that population health information aggregated into kind of a usable format? And, and, and process. An engine of an airplane transmits petabytes of data in real time. And this something that happens if you don't, you know, if people that are gonna get on an airplane are not gonna crash today, it's because of all the information that basically is processed. I think that uh, technology is advancing much faster than healthcare. I think there are sociologic reasons for that. There are also financial reasons for that. Um, I believe that that is exactly the reason why companies like uh, Apple, JP Morgan, Berkshire, and so forth are now deciding that they cannot wait at the uh, pace that uh, healthcare is going because it's obviously going much slower than any other area of our life. And I think that once those entities get in, into, into, into this area, the, the disruptive potential is gonna be so I think we are getting to the tipping point. My, one of my favorite writers, um, Malcolm Gladwell, and that tells you that things like go very, very slowly until the point where everything just uh, goes at the speed of light. I think we are hitting that. Absolutely, Mary Jo, you. Yeah, uh, so I think that we're going to have to get um, much closer to the um, uh, becoming the payor and you know, right now in the volume-based world where most of our health systems live, uh, we are seeing our margins get thinner and thinner, right, as we see payer pressures on us. As we move to, we like to say value, but it's really the risk-based world. If we learn how to accept risk and get closer to that, that premium dollar, um, I think that's where the world shifts. But that is a huge learning curve for most of our health systems. And um, health care in general is risk averse. Uh, if we can make the jump from a volume-based world to, we like to say a value-based world because we like to say what value, but it's interesting. Uh, none of us define value the same way. Go talk to your patients and ask them what they think value is. Go talk to your nurses, go talk to your doctors. I'd be interested to see how many different definitions of value you get. I've taken that on lately. Um, you'll, you'll have interesting conversations, I promise you. But really, um, getting to the world where uh, you are, at, there are, there is an interesting margin to be had if you get closer to the risk-based world where you can get closer to that premium dollar. If we can make that shift, then I think, then we can fund some of the things you're talking about. And I think there are ways to, to get there where we can learn to aggregate all of that data like other industries have done and done successfully. I think we'll have to move from that uh, conservative risk averse stance that we've taken in healthcare for a long time. Thank you. Uh, Wayne, do you have anything that you would add in that area? So when I, going back to your question about, I, I'll just put it in the category of data overload and what do we do with it. Sure. I still think it's, you know, once again, very costly. What's the data that's of significance or do we know yet? But I mean, so I think part of the problem is, as this data is coming in, what's valuable data? 
how do we use it? I think going to Mary Jo's, you know, who has the economic incentive to do that is very important around who becomes the, you know, organizer of this data and, and deliver, you know, helps extract whatever, you know, healthcare value there is. And where that's going to fall out, I think, is an unknown. But I think it's an important thing for us to think about. Absolutely. <clears throat> so I've been thinking about what is the, the energy that can actually uh, propel this revolution. And my conclusion is uh, <clears throat> um, the future generations. And one of my best uh, experiments that I run on a daily basis is I have six kids ranging from 25 to 12 years. Even among them, you see the difference uh, in terms of uh, utilization of digital data, expectation. So I, I was uh, at a, one of the round tables yesterday, I mentioned something that actually happened the other day, uh, cleaning uh, a room, um, my 12-year-old daughter found a DVD and she asked me, what is this thing? And, uh, and I had to tell her the story, basically they said, do you remember when you were very young and I was carrying you, there was this little shop where people would line up for hours to actually get these things. And that was Blockbuster. And so yes, it is very difficult to, to fathom, uh, but uh, I am totally convinced that when the new generations that, are, that grew up thinking that all you need to watch a movie is to click uh, um, on the remote. Are going to expect the same exact things for, for their health. They are not going to be waiting for six hours in a waiting room uh, for a doctor that uh, comes to see them after 600 other patients um, totally burned out and uh, then to wait for their medicines. They are going to expect the drone to drop the medicines at their doorstep. So I think that there is going to be almost a cultural evolution. Unfortunately, it's lower than in other areas, but once the new generations are going to come to power and are going to be the people that actually pay the premium, I think you're going to see the revolution. So that's already happening globally. I have, you know, and as our economy becomes more global, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. My oldest son, um, his job has had him working in Tokyo, and now he's in Sydney, Australia. And there, um, because of the way healthcare is designed, um, he has an app. He looks to see which of the doctors can see him to fit his schedule. And he, it, you know, he chooses them and goes, and they see him to fit his schedule. That's happened for him in Sydney and in, in Tokyo. And when he's home, um, what I call home, that's home for him now. When he's here to see me, he's just disgusted that he can't get similar service unless he goes to a retail clinic in a drugstore, right? And he can't believe that the medical practice at my health system doesn't work that way. And he said, when is the United States going to catch up with the rest of the developed world. And I think you're absolutely right. I think that our next generation is going, that has become more global in how they work is going to demand it of us. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, Giovanni did a great job of setting the stage when you really think about the younger generation and their acceptance of technology. And I would think that, you know, most younger folks are wearing an Apple Watch, they have an Apple phone next to them, or a Fitbit, or some other type of tracking device that's already capturing a lot of the, a lot of the things that you said, Giovanni, as far as you know, capturing um, biostats and, and things of that nature, where there's likely already a whole lot of data on those individuals, you know, day by day, month by month, and year by year. So, so the question I would have is, I, I think many people would agree that personalized medicine is going to change healthcare delivery. I mean, all the things that we're saying. But I, I wonder how much it will really change the population health outcome. And so I read an interesting thing. It was, if you say diet, weight control, exercise, 
all the th you know smoking, the things everybody knows, you know, sort of generally, who fits all of those categories? It's three percent of the population. So even the things everybody knows they should do, they don't do it. Yeah. And so we can do a lot of these things, and it may really change healthcare delivery, and it may you know help us work with certain groups. Patients may be empowered to do things. But until those sort of basic things change, I wonder how much it moves the needle. And I thought that, that is uh, the fundamental problem. And that is the reason why I'm afraid that most of the population health programs, and I apologize if there is, you, you run one, but I'm afraid that they're gonna miserably fail because we can control 10, 15, 20% of the health status of our populations. The rest is not healthcare. The rest is eating uh, seven times a day at um, McDonald's. The rest is uh, not to do the proper, the proper uh, physical activity. That is as truly the potential of destroying this country. I mean, uh, the last data from the CDC indicate that several states now are, are very close to the threshold of 40% of overweight and obese people. Uh, the future may be a future in which half of the population is going to have to work double to provide resources to the other half that is incapa incapacitated to work by the consequences of obesity. There, is, there, there are very bizarre epidemics of diseases that did not exist before, and nobody can, can give an answer to this. When I was a child, how many, how many kids with uh, autism did you meet when you were in school? I mean, the latest data and that official scientific data from 2012 to 2014, the incidence of ASD in, the, in this country increased by 15% in two years. Um, when I was in medical school, to find a case of inf inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn, I had to go to Sweden because, you know, it was extremely rare to see them where I was working. I don't think there is a week that I don't receive a call from somebody begging me to get their kid into, into one of the clinics because the waiting list now is, is months and months. The problem of the equation, in my opinion, that we are not paying enough attention is not that much the output. Yes, we can be more effective. We can, be more, um, we can use our resources more effectively. But this is no longer the country that was 20, 30 years ago. Asthma has been increasing by leaps and bounds. Every allergic disease. We need to specific research to actually not only treat the symptoms, but understand that the, what is going on in our environment and that is causing this. Otherwise, doesn't matter what we do with population health, I think is totally correct. Doesn't matter what we do with anything else. We are gonna have a fundamentally sick population that somebody's gonna have to take care of and the resources are gonna be simply uh, not there. Definitely. We're cheering everybody up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's interesting because you 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 know you you bring up the point of asthma, and then when you you know you look at our our large cities, the air is much cleaner now than it was 20 years ago, but yet we're continuing to see the incidence of asthma increase, you know, COPD, the incidence of individuals with diabetes. So, it's it's, I guess you know from a public health issue. How, does, how, do, how do we kind of get public health officials to kind of tie into population health data and really define approaches that can address some of those underlying causes? Well, nine, nine out of 10 people in this, on this planet that breathe polluted air. This is official data. Uh, when you talk about pollution, be careful because you're talking about the classical pollution, but now we know that there are nanoparticles in the environment that the filters are not blocking because they are nano-size. Nano so um, 20 years ago, nobody was eating uh, genetically modified uh, uh, food. There are no clinical trials on what that can do. Um, one thing is for sure, and I suspect that my a geneticist colleague here will agree on this. You don't change the genes of a population in 10, 20 years. Yeah. So has to be environmental. That, that is a very basic one-on-one 
Um, and, you know, so there is something that we are doing in, with the environment that is generating a rampage in, in, in the growth of the incidence of, this, of these diseases. That is where the real challenge for the future, I think, is going to be. Absolutely. So we're uh, starting to wind down a little. Um, I guess the, the, the question that I would ask, if you had a magic wand, you could do something with population health or pers uh, to personalize medicine, what would, you, what would your approach be? So I'm going to switch from the, uh, I'm gonna, I wanna change the magic wand to a small okay. magic wand, something that I would like, <laughs> since so many people here are from the technology side of things. You know, so we, we sort of talked about how difficult it is at the big picture, but I, I really do, I mean, when I look at the information coming at anyone who's in the clinical delivery side, whether it's a genomic information, whether it's an environmental information, it will change how we deliver our healthcare. And so I see AI projects that are, you know, we can predict more and more from the data. And we learn more and more from the data, but the one thing that I see much less of is how do you implement? How do you put it in the workflow? How do you make it actionable? So I have people come to me with 20 predictive projects and the rare implementation projects. So if I had a little magic wand, I would say let's figure out how to implement these things. That's, that's probably what's of interest to me over the next five years. Great, thanks Wayne. Um, <clears throat> my, ma my magic wand. <laughs> so um, I would love to see us uh, have a magic wand that I, I like yours a lot. But um, this is about bringing back uh, joy and relationship for physicians practicing medicine. Uh, I think back when I was a very idealistic uh, young college student applying to medical school. It was about wanting to take care of people in my community and make my community better. To me, the power of providing a platform for population health and the information for a physician and his or her team so that they can come into work every day and say, I made my community better today. To me, that's the antidote to burnout so that we can make that easy and give them the reassurance that they've done that. Because that's why my colleagues and I went into medicine. And to me, that would be the magic wand I would want for population health. Absolutely, thank you, Mary Jo. My wang is intermediate, I think, in size, but um, what, what, I, what I, I think is happening, I, if you would have asked me this question a couple of years ago, I would have said, I wish that uh, the people that are running Silicon Valley move into healthcare and completely change the culture. It's a cultural issue. Our hospitals, our acad academic um, institutions don't operate like Google, like Apple, and let's face it, those, that, that is the future. And so I hope that um, all the bureaucracy, all the all the um, tactical financial elements that weigh on the, our ability to provide care to, to people are just going to be solved by having, uh, I hope that there are going to be a series of uh, Steve Jobs and um, uh, kind of people that's going to start running uh, healthcare. Well, looks like I, I, I is happening <laughs> because, yeah, so we're because I that. guarantee you that once these people are gonna are gonna enter the market, even just for the sheer uh, simple issue of removing uh, enormous number of employees from our healthcare pro plans, because what they want to do is basically take care of their <laughs> of their people. But that is where a lot of institutions make their money. I think that that is going to generate a true revolution. That has to be the type of revolution that started in 2008 when that guy basically showed up and said, 
this is going to change the world. Yeah. And it was actually pretty close to it. So that's, that's my hope. My hope is that the whole culture changes, in part also taking some of the advice that, that she has been giving. We need to be more human. We need to understand that we cannot load our physicians with an endless number of, of patients. Um, we need to rebuild the social um, texture of our society. And then basically I think finally we are gonna solve this kind of problem. But if we think that we just solve it, just doing the same things once again, is not gonna happen. So let me kind of end with this. Do you, it seems like we're beginning to see that now with kind of a lot of the consolidation with tech companies. So you have Amazon kind of entering the healthcare space and then you have mergers with insurers and pharm you know, pharmacy, CVS Health and Aetna and, and some, of the, some of the things on the horizon. Where, where do you think that's gonna bring us in a year or two? I mean, I, mean, I see it kind of from the cost standpoint mm -hmm. that they're trying to you know, build some cost efficiencies to lower costs. So, so I have to jump in there. I think you okay. really have to differentiate what is innovative around disruption to deliver new things or in what is consolidation to, to protect your market position. And I think a lot of those insurer farm, you know, PBMs is a market protection. It has nothing to do with innovation and disrupting yeah. where we're going. So I, I would really differentiate between consolidation and innovation. Thank you for that. And, 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 and I, do, you know, I do think in some of the things that I see within the market where we have um, technology firms entering the healthcare space, I mean, I think we're beginning to see kind of the infusion of new approaches, new ways right, to that providing that care. I think, however, I, I agree with you, but I think there is gonna be a dominant effect. So the moment that the financial substrate of healthcare is gonna have to change. For example, I, I would agree with you that Aetna CVS is uh, of the uh, type Our two, yeah. true, but uh, if they go to the point of uh, providing most of the care at home, like Aetna uh, keeps talking about, that <clears throat> has the ability. I don't think anything is gonna change if the payment model don't really change. There Absolutely. is still a substantial, enormous component of fee-for-service in this country. If people don't start understanding that to do 20 surgeries that are not needed in the same patient actually makes them lose money instead of make money, I don't think things are gonna dramatically change. I agree with you, but if the financial environment in which we operate changes, there is gonna be a domino effect. There are gonna be collateral um, situations that eventually are gonna bring a new system. Absolutely. Well, um, I think we're at the end of our discussion. Um, I want to thank our esteemed colleagues for joining us. Fascinating discussion. I think you all really bring a, a very different view to, uh, to population health and personalized medicine. I want to thank you for you know, your, your dedication within your, your fields and for really working uh, to help improve the, the quality of health and the way that it's delivered to, uh, to us. So thank you very much.